The first episode of this series described what it means to be alive in a biological sense. We also introduced Carolus Linnaeus' old original system of classifying life forms in a sequence of what he imagined to be uniform taxonomic gradations or ranks. The second episode showed the most basal Linnaean ranks within living organisms, our domain. Episode 3 ran through the first nine clades identified after that, which were all single-celled microbes in successive stages of modification, until we got to the next Linnaean rank, popularly known as the Animal Kingdom. And by then you might have noticed how this old 18th century taxonomic construct was already groaning under the weight of many more categories of life than Linnaeus himself could have imagined. It took four more episodes covering five more formal clades just to get to the next Linnaean rank, and the last one we just saw took 17 episodes to cover another three dozen formal clades just to get to where we are. And matching our phylogeny to the fossil record, that puts us right at the end of the Triassic period, a couple hundred million years ago. And geologic periods are often divided by mass extinctions, and the division here is concordant with what geologists refer to as an enormous rifting event and the largest igneous event in geologic history. The worst extinction ever was caused by a continent-sized volcanic basalt eruption just 50 million years earlier at the beginning of the Triassic, and the end Triassic was evidently another one. Not quite as vast as the previous catastrophe, but still well beyond anything in human experience. What was once a single supercontinent called Pangaea began to tear itself apart. In North America and Eurasia were combined in a northern composite continent called Laurasia, while all of the other continental masses, as well as India, were combined in a second subcontinent called Gondwana. This prompted another concerted system of volcanic activity. It was like today's ring of fire around the Pacific Rim, but it was more concentrated around what would become the Atlantic Rim, so that the east coast of North America and West Africa were connected to South America and Europe. And suddenly, north and south were divided by a border of lava, which expanded, broadening into a ring of lava to be filled in by the formation of the Atlantic Ocean. So, of course, the sea levels fluctuated greatly, and vast areas evidently lost atmospheric oxygen in the midst of greenhouse gases and sulfur dioxide, leading to acid rain, followed by drought and famine and so on, much as it had been before. And as it always has, after this period of climate chaos, everything eventually settled back to its normal balance so that everything could live and breathe normally again, and thus began the Jurassic period. Ornithodirons, uh, dinosaurs and pterosaurs, held up pretty well, probably due to their superior respiration, but the other archosauromorphs of that period were wiped out completely. All of them. Except crocodilomorphs. And that might be because they're so far on the other end of the efficiency scale that they can go up to a year without food if they have to. Uh, every intermediate between those two extremes, however, was gone, along with a few other things, too. And some of the non-mammalian cynodonts survived both the Permian and Triassic extinctions, making them surprisingly successful, especially for a group that is so obscure that only nerds have ever heard of them. Though they eventually died out, too, uh, for reasons unknown, and we don't have any left anymore other than actual mammals, of course. Remember that every species or every group of taxa represented here are all extinct, except mammals. And what we've seen again and again in this series is that several groups will periodically be wiped out at once, and maybe only one lineage out of a dozen will have any survivors. Then whatever's left of that line will either thin out and die later on for whatever reason, or if they can take advantage of or adapt to the new environment, then that one lineage will blossom into many others, especially in the absence of former predators or competitors. And this is a good opportunity to correct a common misconception about evolution. A lot of people think that speciation happens when you cross two existing species to get a third, a hybrid of both of them. But that's almost never the case, otherwise it's completely backward. What really happens is that one species diverges into two, and then four, and then eight, and so on, with each group becoming increasingly distinct over time, just from genetic drift. However, these first divisions are among animals that look pretty similar on the outside. They all look like shrews, or rats, or possums. And that's kind of the template for what mammals used to look like once upon a time. They were all small like that back then. And just as it is with shrews, rats, and possums, the significant differences between them are internal, most often having to do with their teeth. Here the family tree is divided between two main branches, with the oldest or most primitive of them being this cluster at the top, while the oldest theriomorphs are collectively known as triconodonts. Uh, 
Uh, they were named for the triple pointed shearing teeth, similar to a dog's carnassals. And remember that virtually every lineage you see here is extinct too, all except for two groups this time. That lower one will be the subject of a future video. Almost every mammal you've ever heard of comes from that one group, which are the survivors of this group, which are the survivors of this group, and that one, and so on. But there's two or three other highlighted names up there in this cluster at the top, representing the very last surviving species of the most primitive mammals that are still alive. That's the platypus and two genus of echidna. There were others known only from the fossil record, but these are the three species we have left from the group known as the monotremes, also known as prototheria, which means proto-mammals. The name monotreme refers to the fact that they still have a cloaca, like reptiles. That means that instead of having an anus separate from the urinary tract and sexual organs, they have a single multipurpose orifice. So that the penis comes out of the anus in males and females, the vagina and the anus are the same thing. So their eggs come out of the same hole as their poop. Yes, monotremes still lay eggs. Their shells are no more than soft, easily torn tissue, and the eggs hatch very soon after, so it's almost a live birth. It's a choice between laying an egg or giving birth live, because when it's still just a fertilized egg, it's not considered a live birth. We mentioned in a previous video how some of the features mammals are most known for are things that don't usually fossilize, so we have to identify them by skeletal features instead. However, since we have just a couple primitive monotremes still around, these can give us an example of what these earliest mammals must have been like. For example, the echidna has the lowest body temperature of any mammal, other than the platypus. So monotremes are the coldest of the warm-blooded mammals, indicating that the transition from ectothermic to endothermic took a really long time to raise the thermostat. So every cynodont back then could have been as cold as monotremes still are. Monotremes also sweat milk through pores in their skin because they don't have nipples. And we'll talk more about that in a later video. And neither the echidna nor the platypus have external ears, or pinna, like virtually all modern mammals do, or at least did. Now, whales and manatees and such lost them due to streamlining in water, but there's no reason why echidnas would do that. If they ever had them, they should have capped them. And that's a feature that doesn't appear on any other animal but mammals. So it evidently evolved only once. Exactly when that happened is uncertain, but there's no reason to suspect that the first mammals, or proto-mammals, ever had external ears. The earliest fossil impression of external pinnae is a gobaconodontid from 125 million years ago. But we're not descended from triconodonts. We're in a sister clade called theriaforms. So if a triconodont had ears, and our ancestral line had ears, then our common ancestor must have had them too, implying that pinnae evolved shortly after their divergence from the monotremes. So we have indirect fossil evidence from a sister group that one of the definitive traits right from the crown of theriaforms would be the presence of external pinnae. So if you can hear me, you know what that means, right? It means you're a theriform. One day the sun is going to die. For us it means no more sunsets. To the universe, just one less star in the sky And almost all who ever lived have already died 